Okay, well, what is the signature? What does it look like? It looks like the thing in the big parentheses here. That was just how Alice created them. The I's signature is her private key times the thing that came out of the hash for the I signature times the random polynomial she chose for the I signature. Notice something very important here. In each signature, the C sub I's are different and the Y sub I's are different, right? But her private key is sitting there waiting to be plucked off the data if you're clever enough to figure out how to get at it. But I, I mean, it's, it's obfuscated, it's hidden by being in this expression. Okay, so the big parentheses, I just substituted in what SI was. The C, I just copied. Now I simply um, do a little algebra. I, I use the distributive law. I split it into two sums because I have a sum there. Uh, the f of x doesn't depend on i, of course, right? So I can move that out in front. So this line to this line, just a little algebra. But let's think of what these sums look like. Well, let me first think about what this sum looks like. The y sub i's and the c sub i's really have essentially nothing to do with each other. Alice picked the y sub i's at random, and the c sub i's came out of a hash function, and hash functions produce things that look very random. So these products look quite random, and their coefficients of, of the y's and the c's were sort of uniform, in, or were symmetric around zero, okay? So when you take these products on average, as t gets big, this is actually going to get quite small. What about over here? Where he, here I have ci of x times ci of x inverse in some sense. ci of x and ci of x inverse, those are not independent of each other, right? They both depend on i. And if you do an analysis of this, this average actually converges, if the CIs are chosen randomly, to something non-zero. And I'll give you an intuition on it. Remember, our ring is essentially a cyclotomic ring, a, a ring of cyclotomic integers, right? So if you think of X as being an nth root of unity, then, then x to the n minus 1 is really x inverse, is its complex conjugate. If zeta is a root of unity, 1 over zeta is the complex conjugate of zeta, right? So in that sense, essentially, if you analyze it from that viewpoint, the quantity here, this product of these two c sub i's, is a complex number times its complex conjugate. Okay? Um, and if you do that, you get a positive real number, right? So if you add up these positive real numbers, their average will be something non-zero. That's where it's coming from. And one can work out even explicitly this. T as you take more and more random C sub i's, it roughly converges to 4n over 3. So the top line is what Eve uses to attack the system. Right? Eve knows this top line. And she computes it and gets, well, and actually she should, she should multiply this quantity by 3 over 4n to get rid of the 3 over 4n, okay? And she'll get a polynomial with real coefficients. And she rounds the coefficients to the nearest integer because f, remember, has coefficients 0, 1, and minus 1. So if you know f, to within the coefficients of f to within, say, a tenth, you know f, right? Because its coefficients are just zeros, ones, and minus ones. And that's how Eve would recover Alice's private key. If Alice were, um, were, were careless and didn't do the rejection sampling step. Okay, now let's suppose she does it she, she signs things using rejection sampling. I claim that in that case, this transcript 
reveals no information about Alice's private key. Now the first thing I want you to think about is, this is a perfectly valid English sentence. This list of numbers reveals no information about this other quantity. But how do you make that a rigorous mathematical statement and then prove it, okay? So, I, I mean, this isn't at the same level as um, Diffie-Hellman's idea that you could create a crypto system that used two separate keys. That, that was just a mind-blowing idea, even if they didn't know exactly how to do it. But this is a similar sort of thing. It's mind-blowing that a list of quantities created using this secret information would contain no information about the secret thing you used. Once you realize that might be possible, one can think about how to do it and then figure out that, yeah, there are ways to do it. But just the idea, um, I found really, really um, astonishing. So how do we quantify this? What does it mean to say it reveals no information? Well, I'm going to phrase this as a conditional probability. I hope people have seen a little bit of probability theory. So my claim is that if Alice chooses the private key F0, okay, regardless of what F0 is, and regardless of which, remember the signatures are in this box. That's the rejection sampling step, that all the coefficients of the signatures have absolute value at most k minus n. Okay? So signatures have to be in this box. But if I take a potential public key, a private key, and a potential signature, what's the probability that a signature created using F has S equals S naught given, this is the conditional, that F is F naught. Okay? And I want that probability to be independent of F naught. So that would mean that if I used F naught to create signatures, and you used F1 to create signatures, and that person over there used F2 to create signatures, our probability of getting a signature that used, included S naught is the same. And can you see that means that the signatures convey no information about the private key? Because the probability of getting any particular signature doesn't depend on the private key that was used. Okay? So our goal is to prove that this probability, we'll, we'll compute it exactly really, is um, independent of the F naught. Question, and very loud. I cannot understand you. Could, Bjorn, could you take the mic back? And also, I know there was another question in the middle also. We'll do that one next. It, it, in the back. Raise yeah. Um, in this last probability, you don't uh, really take into account the fact that the signatures... Hold, hold the microphone right in front of your mouth. The, the signatures, uh, they are published always with a certain uh, hash of a message. So even if there's the same probability to generate a given signature for some C... You, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm sweeping that under the rug. What this is actually doing, giving is security under what's known as the random oracle model. So you're making an assumption on the hash function that it is completely disassociated from everything else in some sense. And even that's not a precise statement, but that's a good point and it can be made precise and I'm ignoring it. Yeah, there was a question, Bjorn, there's also a question in the middle here somewhere, yeah. Thank you. Do you ever get the same signature uh, with different private keys? Can you ever get the same signature with different with different private keys? Um, well, the answer is yes and no. You you can certainly get the same S's. 
Um, you won't get the same S's and C's. I get well. I guess even that could happen, if, if, but there would be different random Y's that were used to create them. But in fact, the, sa the sample spaces for all these things are so large, the probability of that happening is, is indistinguishable from zero. I mean, the, the, the space of possible S's and the space of possible C's usually would have like two to the 160th elements in it. So you're almost, it, it, it's highly unlikely to ever get a collision like that. That's a good question. Okay, so we want to prove this probability doesn't depend on F naught, even though it's a conditional probability with an assumption that F equals F naught. So let's do the probability calculation. The first line here is just what was on the previous slide, except I made it a little, I, I abbreviated it. So the probability that S is S naught, given that the F you use was F naught, where C and Y are as randomly, uniformly randomly chosen. C with coefficients minus one to one, Y with coefficients randomly from minus K to K. And this relates to, to that question back there. If there's actually any correlation that you know of between Y and C, then you might be able to exploit that. So we're basically assuming the hash function is really what's called cryptographically secure. Um, okay, so what's that probability? How do I compute that probability? Well, I take all the possible C comma Y values, and I look at all the C comma Y values that make the S naught, which remember is CF plus Y, that the S naught uses F naught. And I divide that by the total number of possible C's and Y's. Okay? So this is just how you compute this probability by s listing the number of elements in the set that are winning numbers divided by the number of elements in the set total. Number of winning tickets over number of total tickets. Um, well, let's analyze this a little more closely. How many C comma Y's are there? Well, once I pick my C, remember S naught and F naught are fixed. Once I pick my C, there's only one possible Y, namely S naught minus C F naught. And that Y is only allowed in this pair if its coordinates are at most K. 